Hello, everybody. I'm Chris Biak. I'm the Director of Creative Writing here at Normandale. I'd like to welcome you to one of our wonderful 2021 Virtual Writing Festival events. Uh, this one features our AFA faculty members, Lynette Rainey Grandel and Heidi Sherwick. Did I say it right, Heidi? No? Sherwick. Sherwick. All right, Sherwick. <laughs> I will get it right one of these times. Right, you can say Bagalk when you introduce me. <laughs> So anyway, I'm, I'm really thrilled to have you here and to hear your work because I'm really excited to hear you guys read these things because I'm not sure I've heard them before. So I'm, I'm, I'm an excited audience member as well as the person introducing you today. So uh, we will begin with Lynette Rainey Grandel. Um, Lynette is the author of two poetry collections, Wild Verge and Approaching the Gate, which won the Northeastern Minnesota Book Award for Poetry. In addition to her work with Sonoglyph, she performs frequently at spoken word venues, is a core member of the Basso Poetry Company, and is a seasoned collaborator in multimedia performances. Her poetry has appeared in Alligator Juniper, It's Animal But Merciful, MNArtists.org, Poetry Motel, Revolver, Poetry City USA, Seminary Ridge Review, and more. A crazy fin given to tree worship, she continues to survive the COVID madness by visiting her horse in the forests of Stillwater. So take it away, Lynette. All right, so, um, oh, and how nice. Thank you. <laughs> um, I should have brought my stav with me and so I could be doing that stuff. Yes, I do like to study the old ways. So um, given the weather, the, the time of year it is, um, when, when um, everything's changing, you know, um, the, the, this, it's getting colder, um, death is coming for a lot of things. Um, and, and, and that's always sort of inspires me. So this is a poem um, based on some old Finnish um, uh, songs, basically, folk songs um, and traditions um, called primitive tools. Stone and stone and stone am I, without fur, not the strongest. I am tracking what is missing, hungry for the hard grain that sleeps still. What does it take to wake the ice-bound earth? This slow stillness does not breathe. The seed may never be born but I have learned to forge iron. I have learned to make a knife. I'm gonna read one more poem from this book, at least so far. I don't really have any of this planned out. So um, uh, yes, I'm inspired by my Finnish heritage, not for everything I write, but for some things I write. So I have a whole series of bear poems and uh, here is one of them. I am a bear, a mudhead climbing out of the earth. I am a bear whose lips whisper this sonnet. I am a bear, an animal with a bone between its legs. I am a bear mesmerizing with a well-trimmed beard and dark eyes. Come, look at my loosening robe and run your hands through my glistening fur. I am a bear and I will tell you how Rapunzel became my mother. I am a bear. Vladimir Putin has nothing to do with me. I am a bear. The wolves smell me coming. I am a bear given to dreaming when love mutters its howl. I am a bear. My pinkness sweetens with honey. I am a bear. My tongue is salted with black ants. Okay, so now I'm going to read a couple of newer poems. Um, I'm trying to work on a collection um, that that more, how should we say, more directly uh, goes into the complications of 
my marriage. I've been married for, uh, God, I can't even think how many years, 30 some years, <laughs> um, to somebody who ended up coming out as transgender several years into our marriage, um, and now goes by she and her pronouns, and uh, just actually a couple of years ago had the surgery. And so it took me a long, long time to find poetic language to deal with this. So. Um, I, I, I've started to write a series of poems um, loosely based on the concept of the metamorphoses, Ovid's metamorphoses, um, not the cockroach kind with, with Kafka. <laughs> so um, I'm going to read just a couple of these poems. Um, and here's one that I wrote a while ago. Um, it's called After the May Day Parade. Um, May Day, of course, is the, um, I guess, the, 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 other side of the year from what we're celebrating right now. It's, it's the switch from, um, from winter into spring. After the May Day Parade, I sat with a woman in a dark backyard, fireside amid a circle of celebrants, and together we shared what it's like when your husband decides to grow breasts. She, a star dominatrix, me, a writer and teacher. She, teaching the way to sear skin. Me, how to excavate text. She, an expert in torment in listening. Me, a novice at using my own voice. She, how to brand the flesh of an arm. Me, a woman who refused tattoos. Someone had ribboned the maypole, and now we all stood in the dark and we sang, twining a dance with the streamers, the pagan songs heavy like church hymns. And after, someone told us to hitch up our skirts and leap over the fire, start something new, cast winter behind. No, I couldn't. Too clumsy. She said the same. Too old and too thwarted. But still, we both gazed at the flames, their hungry gold flares like beckoning palms. Together, we stood away from the fire, watching, wondering, then both cried, yes, turning our backs to old boundaries, hand in hand as sisters, we leapt in the night, sharp intakes of breath at the presence of heat as we plunged into the palpable unseen. Okay, and I think I have a couple more time for like one or two more poems. So let's see. Uh, here's uh, here's another one. Uh, this is called "Naming the Parts of the Flower." Sepal, a wariness. A spiky fear that we've exposed too much, laid bare our secret selves, divine feminine that coils in the bedrock of our spines. Corolla, this spinning world, a centrifuge where we clasp our arms around each other, searching from some ground beneath our feet. Pollen, Every time our eyes meet, every time we kiss, every time our bodies stroke each other, every time we close our eyes together. Stamen, the part I miss about you, that part that partied on all by itself, the part you came to loathe, the part you parted from. Anther, a fingertip I draw along your thigh to learn what touches you can tolerate, where you've healed and where you haven't, secret blossom all turned inward, hidden, subterranean. Injury. What happens when we don't know how to touch? Your body flinches, afraid of tenderness, when lovers both recoil, refrain from touch, leaves folded, drooped in agony. Stigma, where the stamen inside out grows up into itself, how it becomes itself an ovule of new life. The calyx opens, 
hearts and lips like petals. Cultivation, where we try to learn the scent and flavor of new soil, where we bring the hummus to our lips, touch all its parts, the creatures that it came from still within us. Field, where we bed together, where our bodies bud, transposed by desire, tingling, ringing in the locus of our souls, bright palette where we stretch before the sun. Flower, the holy wholeness that we are, the soil, sun, and moon of us, the compass rose that blesses each direction, radiant root that lights the path to bring us home. And I think I've got time for one more. Let's see, I don't think I opened this one. Hang on a sec. I should be able to find it. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> uh, this must be it. No. Uh, here we go. Um, this doesn't have a title yet. Well, I guess it does. It's I've lived inside so many creatures. Uh, I have lived inside so many creatures to pursue you and you so many selves. How did I become a flying skein of geese mounting smoky stratus clouds and welling with your name? A thousand wings beat greedily against my spine. We are a murmuration dark starlings, hundreds winding, folding our transparent veil and tumbling turns above the tawny harvest fields. The orchards now stand empty of their apples, but darling, let me light that feline fire. Flip me like a mouse you toy with and be amazed at how I change for you. A gold-toothed grizzly rearing to the challenge a gasp between the lightning bolt and sound. The curtains part and Isis crests her golden throne. I've lost who is the cat who laps a silver saucer and who's reduced to liquid disappearing. One of us is hunger, one of us is thirst. Okay, and that's it for now. Thank you so much, Lynette. Oh uh, yeah. Yay! <laughs> applause, applause. Um, I, it's just so calming to hear you read. You just have such a fantastic reading voice. And I know you taught me how to read once because you said it was because you were on the radio. So you used to do a radio show. So right on radio. So um, thank you for that wonderful reading. Um, our next reader will be Heidi Serwick. <laughs> I read her bio, and if you think of it as Sir Wick, like, you know, you have a title, then that's how I'm going to do it. That's how I'm going to remember it. So Heidi Serwick is the author of the lyric essay collection Fluid States, selected by Dinty W. Moore as the winner of the Pleiades Press 2018 Robert C. Jones Prize for short prose. And she's also the author of the poetry collection Conjoining. She's the editor of North Dakota is Everywhere, an anthology of contemporary North Dakota poets. She writes and teaches in Minneapolis, and she, where she is the editor for Assay, a journal of nonfiction studies. So let's welcome Heidi. Thanks so much, Chris. And thanks for all your work putting together this festival every year and for everybody's help in making sure it goes down. Um, <laughs> I'm going to read from some new work I've been working on, and I'm not totally sure what it is or if it even works, but um, I've been working on craft essays about the lyric essay that are in themselves lyric essays. And so it's been kind of a weird thing I've been trying to do. And one of them uh, just came out in the collection, A Harp in the Stars, an anthology of lyric essays. Um, and I think the only thing you would really need to know about it um, is the myth of the labyrinth from Minos that uh, Daedalus was the architect and um, Ariadne was the princess who had a spool of 
thread that she threw down it that would um, give Jason the path through it. Was it Jason? I think it was Jason. I'm not sure. Um, Theseus. Per Theseus. Yeah, yeah, that's it, Theseus, okay. It's called Success in Circuit, Lyric Essay as Labyrinth, with thanks to Karen Babine for delightful turnings. And it starts with a uh, epigraph. We create passages for a reader to move through, seeing and sensing what we devise on the way. And when the reader's done, levitation. She looks down and sees how she's traveled, sees the pattern of the whole. Jane Allison, meander, spiral, explode. My first experience of a labyrinth was the movie of that name, one I watched repeatedly on a nascent HBO, a beautiful and disturbing fairy tale in which a nascent teen girl, Jennifer Connelly, must travel to the heart of the labyrinth to retrieve her infant brother from the Goblin King, a provocatively dressed David Bowie. Of course, that labyrinth was actually a maze, or maybe not. But currently, I'm in a bee-filled garden, drinking ice-cold cider and buzzing with Karen among piles of books. We're spending a summer afternoon talking around and around the issue of mode, what it is and how it affects movement, specifically momentum in the lyric essay, what drives it forward so that you end in a different place than you begin. I'm trying to articulate how, rather than a piece advancing by plot with narrative or story moving us forward, and instead of logic advancing the argument of a piece, there are essays that are circuitous, nonlinear, that spiral around a central concept or incident or image, accruing meaning as they move. No forks, no false moves, no misdirection, only perhaps a pleasant disorientation as the writing twists and turns. It occurs to me that such an essay might be described as a labyrinth, to turn, turn will be our delight till by turning, turning we come round right. Like Daedalus, we construct both the meander and the thread to follow it, disorientation by design. When I think of the labyrinth, aside from Bowie, I think of Borges, a master of the lyric essay form, though I don't want to evoke the garden of forking paths. While many conflate a labyrinth with a maze, they are not the same thing. And I want to amaze, but not lose you. A maze is a puzzle that puts all choices of path and direction with the walker. There are many dead ends. In a labyrinth, the only choice is whether to enter. A labyrinth is defined by its circuits, its singular unicursal path solved merely by walking. The way in is the way out, a via negativa. If this were a maze, we would need Ariadne's clue, C-L-E-W, a ball of thread and source for our word clue, C-L-U-E, to follow. But this is a labyrinth, and if the way in is the way out is the way through, then in a well-constructed lyric essay, we don't need a clue, or rather the path is the clue, the thread unspooling. When I say thread, it is important to remember that while Daedalus designed the walls that define the structure, it is the path, the white space, the via negativa that gives a labyrinth its capability, an artistic space to move through, to engage with, both the literal white space employed in fragmented lyric essays, but also the figurative white spaces, the lyrical lateral leaps and logic across which we bound faithfully, propelled by the prose. To turn, turn will be our delight. This affinity for the lyric, for poetic prose, comes from its source in verse, which means to turn, its recursive language spiraling, but not out of control. The careful writer keeps that path open, if not always apparent, an intention that can be traced, though not always at first reading. There will be clues. The author means to lead, not lose you. While the lyric essay may follow the labyrinth, Karen and I are prisoners in a maze and our discussion resembles Borges's garden with forks we do not follow, false turns for tracing our steps. What is mode and how is it different from form or shape? Is essay noun a form, but essay verb a mode? Is there pure lyric in prose? Must there always be movement and does it have to be forward? 
Can it be recursive so long as it's not redundant? Can I have another piece of rhubarb bunt cake? Who's doing this well and what do they call it? Who decides taxonomy, the writer or a critical reader? But I have taken notes and am returned to tell you all. Brian Doyle made a great Daedalus and would concur that by turning, turning we come round right. Karen and I are now discussing his joyous Volodoras, how it's not linear, but has a path through it, labyrinthine. I am reminded that there's a moment as you near the center of the labyrinth where you turn, are turned back, sent spiraling to the outer circuits, left wondering if you've lost the thread, clueless. In his essay, we start with the speed of a hummingbird's heart, its beauty giving way to its brief beating. Then we move sideways, turn toward the consideration of other hearts, those of whales and birds and worms, before eventually wending to the human. In verse, in poetry, there is a term for a rhetorical turn called the volta. Just before the heart of this circuitous essay that beats so bright and briefly, we reverse course and zoom out, turn back to human scenes, which seemed unrelated before. Like a thousand volts, we are sent straight to the heart of the essay, the labyrinth center. But Doyle has prepared us, unspooling that thread throughout for us to follow across the white space of his paragraph breaks and subject leaps, an intention that can be traced. There must be a path to follow, a negative capability inherent in the design. When I was a young, inexperienced artist, I got the Chart Labyrinth, a cathedral floor design, tattooed on my back by a similarly young, inexperienced Daedalus. Tattoos, like lyric essays, are best crafted by someone with control of its elements, someone who can balance intuition with technique, lest the structure collapse. While I loved the experience of getting that tattoo, the meditative humming as the stylus traced its design in black ink, and while I loved the tattoo at first, 20 years later, it has turned into a muddy mess. Identifiable, but the path is gone, the thread lost. Recently, I went to a consultation for a new tattoo. The new artist and I, again, each of a similar age, but now with the skill of years of practice. After we settled on the new image and its placement, Top turned to my other tattoos. It made her sad I hated my labyrinth tattoo, though she was not responsible. She offered to fix it, not by re-inking the, the labyrinth, as I assumed, but rather the inverse, to trace its obscured path, what makes the pattern possible to tra traverse in white ink, redefining and reclaiming it. Her stylus would emphasize that white space, that via negativa, so I could feel positive about the tattoo once again. Her turning would be my delight, her intention traced in white. Talking about Doyle's essay reminds me of my appointment. And when I tell Karen about this revelation, she, this revolution, she says, you have to write this essay. When I do so, when I turn to research, I find that a darker metaphor for the labyrinth's path is Christ's harrowing of hell, symbolic of his breaking death's prison. This, in turn, is reinterpreted as the road to Jerusalem, inscribed in medieval cathedrals like Chartres, a substitute for those pilgrims who would walk Christ's path, but who could not make the trip. Either way, the labyrinth is reenacted as a journey inward through physical and metaphysical space in order to return transformed. At the end of Labyrinth, the girl, Sarah meets, the girl Sarah meets the Goblin King at the center and solves his puzzle by declaring, you have no power over me. This might suggest that the maze maker possesses no real power, that it's all a lovely fraud. What it actually reveals is that this maze was in fact a labyrinth, that its process was not the physical path, but an interior journey that leads Sarah to this re realization. But that space must be meaningful. You want the reader to be a willing pilgrim within its patterns, not a prisoner. Otherwise, they might just strike across the floor's pattern, fly away, escape. Like a literary Lazarus, an undead Daedalus, I am returned to tell you all the clue to the lyric essay, a labyrinth that uses its repetitions with variations, its circuitous patterning to delight and disorient 
but lead us, turning and leaping in a ritual dance around its center. Thanks. And then I have a very short piece that's an excerpt of another um, craft essay on the lyric that is a lyric essay um, that is about the use of white space, um, how, how people use white space in lyric essays. And it's called uh, Zero at the Bone. Emily Dickinson knew something about holding space, the power dashes have. The white spaces hold so much, the ghost of her white dress posing in the corner. They may be silent, but are not empty. Like musical rests, like caesuras, which have value, this is what the spaces say. John Cage experimented with silence in his music. After an experience in a completely soundproof chamber, he realized that far from silent, he could still hear his nervous and circulatory systems, his breath, a white noise. Silence is impossibility. Cage claimed he composed all the notes to four minutes and 33 seconds, also called the silent sonata but that they were all silent. I think about this reading Jenny Bully's The Body, an essay, where the footnotes refer to a text that exists fully imagined, but rendered unreadable, absent. Each note, each sound, each correspondence whited out. X times zero equals zero. Zero, the great eraser, the great erasure. Terry Tempest Williams in When Women Were Birds recounts how her dying mother left all her journals to be read only after her passing. When Williams does, she finds that all the journals are blank. At first, this revelation is confusing, even cruel. But now, 25 years after I first opened the journals, I am finally able to think about what this emptiness means. There is an art to writing, and it is not always disclosure. John Cage said, I have nothing to say, and I am saying it. Zero at the bone. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> wow, I just, I absolutely love that I that totally meta idea of writing in the form that you're writing about and it it's very labyrinthian. <laughs> Not totally sure it works, but I was like, ah, it seems like it should be fun. <laughs> it works. It works. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, there was a cart rolling by, so I muted myself. Um, <laughs> um, it looks like we have a question in the Q&A. Um, it says, what inspired you to incorporate singing into the essay, the first one? Um, I, that's a really interesting question. I have the lyrics in there from um, Simple Gifts um, because of the turning. And I have never had to read this out loud because um, like the book just came out like a week and a half ago, I think. And so they're just starting to do readings from it now. And I was like, oh yeah, because I'm scheduled to do a couple. And I was looking through it and thinking, should I sing it or should I not? And I was like, why not? It's, it's kind of a block of um, prose. And while it's kind of weird enough that it holds your attention, it's also still kind of a block of prose. So I thought maybe trying to sing it as part of the performance of it rather than just reading it would break that up, it'll like catch your attention again. Well, um, you know, I'd, I'd kind of extend that um, to Lynette. Lynette, you do some singing as part of your performances as well. So what yeah. kind of dictates your decision about when to sing or use tonal uh, things in your poetry? Um, 
Do you mean when I'm performing it, when I'm reading it? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, whether I'm feeling confident or not. I mean, really, that's that's the only thing. You know, you, you just kind of feel it or you don't feel it. Um, and it has a lot to do with feeling like there's an audience there that wants to listen. Um, I love listening. I, I love reading to audiences because it's, it's actually part of my um, writing process to take something relatively new and read it and kind of listen to the breathing and you know the coughing or a lack thereof and in and and, and and figure out you know is this working and then i can also hear it myself in it and i'm and i'm trying to hear it from the audience's perspective and and so um i've found that reading on zoom is harder though um today i'm feeling okay about it because i I think I, you know, seeing the chat and knowing many of you in the chat, um, it's just really fun. And then and I know you guys and you want to hear what I have to say too. So, so that's really quite helpful actually. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, I think it does take courage. So thank you, Heidi, for doing that. Um, because you know, I mean, music and <laughs> just shitty singing voice. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're just, they're just, oh, they're so you don't. woven. I have a lot of poems actually where I'm invoking music and and uh, actually in, in my prose i'm trying to write about music too so um yeah yeah i think i think it's very important uh, the, the 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 spoken word is musical well i was just thinking that heidi you had a very nice singing voice and that maybe we could maybe recruit you into some kind of girl group here <laughs> you know anna meek's also a singer who's a poet so yeah i don't you know, know. And, and I was feeling really envious of um, Jeff Herbach at Mankato. They've got like a whole rock band in the English department. <laughs> Why don't we have that? So, so yeah, let's, let's do something with that. I think it'd be great. So Lynette, there's a question for you in the Q and A. Can you see that? Um, oh, I guess I can. Let's see. Um, oh, no, no. Uh, so Kara says, um, Lynette, did you know your husband was trans before she came out? uh and how did you handle it other than creating poetry about it yeah well okay so so here's here's the i'll try to make the long story as brief as possible so we got married in 1983 if you can imagine what life was then i mean that's like probably when your parents were born or maybe not even maybe your parents are younger than that anyway we got married in 1983 and um uh, no, there was no indication um, that Venus is what I call her now, um, but Steve then, um, and and I've, I've, I'm allowed to use that name by the way because I know that you're not you're not supposed to do that sort of thing, but but because I've been writing memoir that's about that time, um, I have been given permission by Venus to do that. So anyway, uh, and it wasn't until 1988 that she started coming out and even then it was it was a little unclear she said she was transgender and then um was a cross-dresser for many years and then it just started increasing she thought she was she thought she was a uh, part of the fetish community for many many years um and it really wasn't until um i want to say like three or four years ago now that she finally decided that she actually had to have the legal name change and gender change and surgery and everything like that but she'd been on hormones for many years before that so 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 we've been we've been living in this sort of sort of gray area for the longest time and um it ha it, it was really hard for me to figure out how to write about it part of it was that it, it didn't feel like my own story and then with venus the story kept on changing you know because she would she would think she was okay at a certain at a certain point you know sort of plateauing here but then a couple of years later it was like oh i want to do more you know so it just kept on being an uh, a moving target shall we say and i never quite knew how to handle it so um but two things um thanks to chris here <laughs> she she told me like four or five times i should write a memoir and the last time she told me that i i decided to follow her advice. And so, um, and so when I started writing, I started developing some language. And then the other big thing that helped me was um, the Supreme Court decision to uh, 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 make gay marriage legal. And suddenly I felt as if I didn't have to hide anymore. Um, which is a weird thing because we were already way out there anyway, Venus fronts a rock and roll band and she, she's a she's a very public person um but it still felt as if i could sort of like 
not come out at work, you know, because I was a little afraid about what would happen. So, so it's been a very long journey for me. And um, the fact that we talk pretty regularly about trans issues in, in the greater society um, has just given me a lot of permission as well as um, understanding terminology that feels right to use in poems. So that's as short an answer I can make on that one. Sorry about it. Okay, are there any other questions anybody has? Checking out the chat, checking out there. I've got another one in the questions. Oh wait, I think that was the one we already answered though, yeah. Yeah. Lynette, okay. I have a question for you. Sure. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the bear, like what, what the bear symbolizes? Is this like from uh, Finnish folk tales or is this like a personal symbology or? It's, it's, it's Finnish, um, let's say mythology, culture, um, old stories. Um, so uh, several years ago, I got interested in exploring the Finnish half of my heritage as maybe a source of poetry. Um, um, up to that point, I didn't think I had an interesting heritage to write poems from, and I was I was envious of a lot of my friends who did seem to have interesting backstories, but my parents never told stories about the past, and, you know, we were just like, you know, white bread trying to fit in, um, which I understand is, is actually a a cultural problem for white people now. So, so anyway, one of the ways I tried to solve that was to um, um, do some research into Finnish heritage. Um, by this point, everybody who I could have asked questions of had passed away. And so I know very little about my own family history other than a few facts. Um, but this allowed me to kind of play fast and loose with things and imagine what people's lives might have been like. And one, along the way, one of the things I learned about was in Finnish culture, the bear is, is sacred. Um, the bear is oftentimes referred to as the old man of the woods. Um, women marry bears. Sometimes the bear is ritually killed. Um, the bear actually comes from the great bear constellation, what we know here more as the Big Dipper. Um, and so the... the um, the killing of the bear is actually a whole formal thing. They have, you know, songs and feasts, and it's sort of like an Irish wake with the bear's body propped up at the end of the table, and then, um, and then, and then the, the the bear's skull is put in the the top of the tallest tree, and it's supposed to go back up to the stars that it came that the bear came from, Otso came from, and so, um, and this is true in many many cultures. It's not just Finnish culture that you know the, the Ainu and I knew I think it is in Japan and a lot of the uh, Canadian Native American tribes tribes have all of these bear things going on so I mean, very similar kinds of things and so, so it seems to me that it's about um, the bear is central in the wheel that kind of turns the earth and it's it's the the spinning of the stars around the north star and it's um, anyway anyway that's so 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 I've I've sort of adopted the bear as an interesting figure in my life Looks like we've got some more here. Thank you, I love that. Yeah, so for Heidi, can you talk a bit more about your research process, writing process for the labyrinth piece? That's from Whitney. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. It wasn't so much a research piece um, other than like, it, it was mostly from all the conversations that, um, Karen Babine used to teach at um, North Hennepin and now teaches in um, Tennessee in Chattanooga. Um, but she's the editor in chief at Assay and I'm one of the contributing editors, but we we're both really interested in craft essays um, because it just feels like there's such a dearth of them in creative nonfiction that fiction and poetry, I guess, have been around for so much longer that there's like lots and lots of stuff about it. Not as much about creative nonfiction. And particularly from my point of view, not very much at all on the lyric essay, especially since creative nonfiction 
largely once it started being taught at all was mostly being taught from the perspective of journalism and or fiction um but writing about true stories you know but using those techniques and not really coming from poetry and all of my trainings in poetry um that i got all my degrees in poetry and when i first started publishing i was publishing poetry but then kind of sidestepped into um, nonfiction and mostly lyric essays. Um, so a lot of it came from just discussions that she and I were having about um, like how nonfiction works and trying to explain things. Um, yeah, and then just making weird connections. And that was part of it was that as, as we were talking about it, I kept noticing like all these these notes um that i was making about um i was trying to say that um lyric essays didn't necessarily move forward in the way that an argument or a narrative does and that quite often they move laterally and that they're kind of circling around their subject and after a while i started calling it a labyrinth and then that connected to the david bowie movie and um then i was thinking about the tattoo and that that's kind of where it came together um and then obviously thinking about the myth of it so it didn't really do any research for it because i knew a lot of these things but it also seemed like they all belonged in the same essay because i was trying to make an argument about how they moved laterally so including all these things and circling and coming back to them um, in different paths made it act like a labyrinth so that you know you're moving forward but it's by doing this very circuitous circling motion um to get to my point <laughs> so i'm whitney i'm not sure that i had a like actual research for it but it was mostly just like a coming together of lots of things and this was the first one where i really hit on the idea of because i was trying to do a craft essay about lateral moves and in writing it, I was like, well, I'm just gonna make it move like a labyrinth and then realizing, okay, this is gonna get weird fast and just deciding to go with it. I, I loved when you brought the piece of pie in there. That was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, Karen is an amazing baker and yeah, she, she made that fantastic cake and I, yeah, I just had to have some more. So, um... Joshua has a question for each of you. Uh, we'll start with Lynette because then we'll, you know, then we can go back and forth. Um, Lynette, you said, let's see. Well, I have to read both of them together, I guess. To Heidi, when exactly did you decide to get the tattoo and why, as in what moment was your decision finalized and where did you get that idea from? And to Lynette, you said your choice was the result of a radio job. You still have that job. Why or why not? I'm, what the choice about what I can't remember. Well, I think we, we were talking about the voice. Um, oh, right, right. Oh, the voice. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and yeah, so, so the radio thing was actually volunteer, um, for many years, um, probably like close to two decades. I think I, um, co-hosted a radio show on KFAI community radio called right on radio, where we interviewed writers every week. It was an hour long show and people who are coming through nationally touring would be on the show we'd interview local writers published unpublished you name it um, for a long time we were affiliated with the loft which made it really convenient to um, to get the writers who were coming to town for loft events um, to to come to the show um, and, and and basically um, it, 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 it I just since it was a volunteer gig it took up too much of my time eventually so actually when I started writing the memoirs about the time <laughs> I quit doing write on radio um, because my schedule just wouldn't allow anymore um, I still have my my key fob for KFAI and I'm still welcome back but they've they've changed the equipment so many times I don't think I know how to run the board anymore um so that's a little tricky but um i i don't know i should be on sabbatical next year so maybe i'll get involved with it again but it 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 was sort of like interviewing other writers about their process was so helpful that was my mfa really is asking people about their writing process and then in terms of voice it's really helpful to have a microphone in front of you and headphones on so you really hear and then you know 
Um, and then the secret, the secret to a radio voice is to kind of relax your jaw like this, you know. And so, <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. So I got kind of used to that. Okay, and then Heidi, your question was about your tattoos. <laughs> Which I think you said, Lynette, that you, something in one of your pieces oh, yeah. about I don't not have any them. tattoos. I, I, just don't want, them. I don't want any permanent marks on Yeah, me. I don't either. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they're addictive though. Um, so the, um, all of the tattoos that I've gotten have been tied to a manuscript that I was working on. And then I would get a tattoo to commemorate it. And um, the labyrinth one was from my doctoral thesis that was called um, Hiking the Maze, which is a section of um, Canyonlands in Canyonlands National Park in Utah. So I got the um, tattoo when I was, I don't know, like in my wow. mid to late 20s. I guess in Salt Lake City. And I think the tattoo artist was also in her like mid to late twenties. <laughs> she was very young. And I think just too inexperienced to say, this needs to be bigger or else it's just gonna run together over time. Like she didn't know enough to talk me out of it. That was just like, yeah, we can do this. Um, and when I had been looking up maze or labyrinth patterns to to get a a tattoo. I just thought the Chartres Cathedral one was the prettiest. So that's really it. <laughs> and it's it's pretty ugly right now. I haven't because when I got the um, other tattoo, um, and she was saying we could make an appointment to clean it up. That was like right pre COVID. So I haven't had a chance to go back and get get the labyrinth cleaned up. Yeah, and I'm not sure. I, I hope everybody listening understands. So, so the labyrinth, like the kind of Heidi's talking about, like chart, um, it's not one that you get lost in. So, you described it perfectly, where you know you kind of loop around like this, and then you get to the center, and you start back, and you go around the side of it again. Um, and it's it's meditative. It's a walking meditation, is what it is, and it's wonderful. Yeah. And uh, Kara wants to know if you're a Mandalorian fan. Okay, I'm guessing that's because of Baby Yoda in the shot. I'm just guessing, but uh, I mean, yeah, I enjoyed it. I, I was watching it mostly with my son um, last winter and he got me Baby Yoda for Christmas. So <laughs> Baby Yoda now lives in my office, but, but yeah, it's a good show. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> I, I, I have not read Baby Yoda poems yet by anyone, but I'm sure they're coming, you know. I, I have never watched, I've watched the two episodes and I, then I think we canceled our subscription to Disney and that was that. <laughs> oh my God, it is good, it is good. Yeah. So, well, we are heading towards the end of our session here, but um, are there any final quick comments or questions anyone has? I actually have a labyrinth poem. I don't know Yay. if you want me to read it. Should I read it? Sure, read it. That's a nice read way it. to end. Yeah. All right. This one's in, in uh, Wild Verge. And this is about uh, a labyrinth actually at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, outside yeah. at a, the top of a hill, walking the labyrinth. The path is a series of loops, big and small, I step forward and forward and forward, listening to foot fall and the sound of feet treading and breathing, the measuring in and out and all of my muscles moving in slow measured rhythm. The hollowness and the wholeness of this routine movement, the beauty of how at a turn one leg must move farther, the stride of one leg reaching, overtaking another it astonishes me. I see the feet of others before and behind me casting their own little pathways in varying patterns, fanning out, closing in, fanning out again, and then brought to a single line. 
Who would have guessed that a spirit inhabits geometry? I could measure cubic yards of air if I wanted to. I'm holding the air in my hands, palms tilted towards heaven. It is full of oxygen. It embraces me back. What a lovely way to end our reading. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, thank you, Heidi. Thank you, Lynette. It's been just a real enjoyable reading. Thank you all of you for coming. Yes, Joshua, metaphor for life. Exactly. That's what that is. Lots of claps. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. We have one more event in the writing festival. It's the student uh, reading. So I hope that you'll join us for that if you have time. And if you don't, that's understandable too. But uh, uh, we've had a great time here at the virtual festival. And I hope you'll join us next year where, fingers crossed, we will all be together in a room without our masks on. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Have a great day. Bye. Thanks, everyone.